Sorry, first time. <laughs> So, um, okay, so I, uh, uh, I'm going to present you a quick uh, uh, resume of some of some two works we've been doing the past two years. I started my master's. I tried to make it quick. I know it's the last presentation of the day. Uh, so we are doing this work in collaboration with these guys. Uh, Egg has already told you about almost all of them. Sigurdur from uh, Reykjavik, Dennis, that is also from São Carlos, like me. Uh, Dominic and Pirmin that are from Basel, from Switzerland. Uh, so we are working with Shubnikov the Haas probing of quantum wells. So we use this magnetic oscillations, this phenomena of measuring conductivity while changing magnetic field on your sample, uh, to probe uh, things from our system. So what are this? This is his ma the overview of the talk. I'm just going to introduce uh, Shumnikov the Haas oscillations, uh, then talk about what's been done uh, or somewhat new treatment of the Shumnikov the Haas oscillations, and why is it good? Uh, why it describes why we can probe things uh, and, and, and find new interesting results, and then the results we've been finding in these two works here. Uh, okay, so starting what. What is Shumnikov the Haas oscillations? A good way to see it is uh, by, by explaining the semi-classical picture of why they happen. You uh, they are foremost uh, basically periodical oscillations in conductivity when you raise your magnetic field or change it. So what happens is that you get peaks on your oscillations, on your, on your uh, conductivity or your resistivity whenever you, you mess up with your magnetic field. Uh, those peaks basically happen because when you put a uh, magnetic field, you you landalize your system, right? So you can only conduct through these levels. This l uh, now these levels are quantized where they weren't before. So the way to see it semi-classically is that without a magnetic field, you just have your bands in a quantum system. For example, the two DAG here. We're mostly going to talk about two DAGs. Uh, so you have your system without magnetic field. You take it. You have an EF, uh, Fermi energy. Since we are going to work at low fields, we're going, in going to maintain it uh, at the same place all the time. So you consider these bands, you just uh, you add the magnetic field by quantizing orbits. Uh, in the Sommerfeld way, the one that we learn in classes, in uh, I guess in college, and then in real space, you'd get like uh, round orbits. But round orbits in real space are also round orbits in moment momentum space. So now you have like just quantized orbits on your B0 bands. That's a picture that's semi-classical, uh, but it, it's it, it gives very precise uh, predictions up to some points. So I get cyclotron orbits on bands. After you do that, you see that those cyclotron orbits, they pass through uh, like a fixed energy here or EF or Fermi energy at a certain velocity and its frequency depends with the area of the cyclotron orbits. So what this means in the long run, as we know that the area here goes as Kf squared, so this goes almost like uh, n occupation number, you get that the frequency goes as the occupation number of your band, right? So you get here the magnetic oscillations I've been talking about. Uh, for a system like this, for example, you would have a lot of them, uh, they would all be all clumped together when your magnetic field is, is, is small, and then we, when you start raising them, a lot of them will pass through and they will be like, oh yeah, uh, now I have a little level, I can, I, can, uh, I can scatter, now I don't have any more, I don't scatter anymore, and, and so on. Uh, <coughs> this, as we see, this uh, kind of dumping here, it's caused by, by, by impurities, we, we model that, there's no problem with that. That's what you will also see in experiments. So <sighs> why are they useful? What, they, what people do with them? Well, first things that, would, that was done that's by that and Das was using that kind of formula and saying, hey, we have two bands now, so we know that for each band how things work. Uh, so now what, what if I have two bands? They must have like different areas and different uh, certain energies, right? So if I go with different areas, I get two different frequencies, so I will see a beating, and that's how you explain beatings in systems that have, for example, uh, Rashba, 
uh, term, uh, spin orbit term. Because you split the band that you had before, so now I have different areas, uh, and then you get this different frequency and beatings. And from that, you can also estimate Rashba. Engels did that. Uh, of course, this is a very simple kind of way of seeing it, so it often uh, overestimates. You have some criticisms on that, on that way of treating stuff. Uh, well, other things you can do, now you can look at Rashba plus Dresselhaus in some kind of bands. People have done this uh, rec recently for this kind of uh, uh, 2D quantum wells. Uh, and they, uh, one thing that happens that is known for a while is that a third peak appears instead of just two. So that's a feature that you cannot explain with that theory, simple theory I just, I just talked to you about. Uh, what, what you need in that case, it's more complex. Uh, since when you put these two kind of uh, terms, for example, uh, you can see that a cut in the bands, like a cut in a certain energy, will turn, in turn out to be something like this. And now, uh, instead of, have of having two bands, you have something that is more weird here. So now you can your electrons can do this kind of, uh, of motion, of quantized motion, or this one. So now you have three, three different, uh, or this inside one. So these are like three different areas, three different frequencies. That's a kind of physical way to see it. Uh, that you would be able to kind of take from, from what I just said. So uh, this kind of uh, magnetic breakdown that I just explained is something that you cannot uh, understand from those uh, from this picture. Uh, it also needs some kind of corrections. Uh, this was argued by Winkler, Kepler, uh, Tarasenko to, to show this picture and why it fails. So yeah. Um, we also have some recent measures in topological materials by this group of Boykman that also did some of the last measures I show you. Uh, they measure like uh, topological material and these beatings that appear here are weirder than the ones that we saw before. They are not very well theoretically explained. Uh, they, they argue that these two are because you don't have like a difference in spin orbit bands here, but everything down here is not quite well explained. So we thought, hey, we have this formalism, maybe, maybe let's test them in topological materials. And well, uh, so this new kind of formalism that should explain better those kind of jumpings, magnetic breakdown and stuff like that, or even topological materials, uh, is this one. So we basically say we, we use like this kind of Boltzmann, Boltzmann equation approach to say that we can analyze everything that we have basically by our density of states. So our resist of, uh, resistivity in the x-x direction, which is the important one for Shubnikov the has oscillations, is basically propor proportional to the density of states. Just like I said, you need states to scatter. When you have states to scatter, you have uh, high, uh, high resistivity. So that's how we work with things. So basically here we start with, with a density of states. We know that we have Landau levels, so we just have this kind of delta functions. We use some uh, Poisson summation formula to open it in a nice way. And here we have like uh, the, the inverse function of the energy, which gives you the no lambda level number that you are in right now at some energy, when, when you are at energy, I don't know, any energy, for example, EF. So that's basically all we need, right? If, uh, if, we, if we accept that the main uh, mechanism behind this Shumnikov the has oscillations are just which land level we are, if we are in the land level or not. So yeah, we take this kind of thing. Now we put ad hoc, oops, I wrote it ah, in, a, in another way anyway. Uh, so uh, we take this f function and we add some broadening to it to account for scatterings, stuff like that. It doesn't change much. Now we got this dingo factor, which is the one that explains that dumping that appears for low magnetic fields, basically, Okay, so this is what I just explained. Is basically when you pass into a Landau level, you see a raise in the resistivity because you have states to scatter right now. So when you have an electric field, this shifts a little bit. Uh, it gets a little bit like this, and now you have. Uh, if you're not completely filled in this band, you can uh, when when you have leads, for example, here and here, you can just keep jumping from this level to here so that you have a conductivity in the x direction. 
Uh, anyway. So what happens when you have two kinds of lambda levels is what we're looking here for. For example, in that case that I explained with the, with the rush splitting, what happens is that you have two kinds of, of, of lambda levels. These two kinds of lambda levels pass through EF with different velocities. Here we are treating everything fully quantum mechanically because this F function just comes from the inverse of all the energies that we, that, that we have in the quantum system itself. Uh, so here we should account for a kind of uh, spin mixing we have from more complicated systems uh, that, for example, have magnetic breakdown and we, we didn't know how to describe before uh, because we are all using like uh, magnetic field zero bands to, to describe all the problem. But here we accounted for the magnetic field, so all these problems should go away. So the first application we, we use it with is to uh, exactly account for that problem in Rashba plus Dresselhaus, Dresselhaus Hamiltonians. So here's just a, a common Hamiltonian with Rashba and Dresselhaus, in which you have like the Rashba, which is the microscopic, microscopic inversion symmetry. Uh, you have an asymmetry in your quantum well. Here you have the, uh, the other one is Dresselhaus, so it's bulk, so it's inside of each one of those parts. You have like the crystalline stru structure, so for example, in graphene, you have a basis, so in it breaks inversion, and then you get this kind of terms when you do those kind of group theory, uh, uh, when you do, sorry, uh, KP theory, Kane models, and stuff like that. Uh, so yeah, here we just took that Hamiltonian, processed it a little bit, added magnetic field. So here we have the energies, and they are tagged by uh, up and down uh, pseudo spins. Now I'm mixing spins when I add my magnetic field, and I account for that differently from when we have like two bands, and I don't want to account for for mixing of spins that comes from the magnetic field. So now when I invert that to get my n, which is basically my f function that we'll describe if I'm passing through a little level or not, uh, I will get these two pseudo spin numbers, like, like I showed before. This p here will account for spin. And then I see my beatings again. So the fun thing when I have Dresselhaus and Rush, but at the same time, is that I have some peaks, uh, so an envelope function. We can do this, this math. Uh, numerically, no problem with the f function. Uh, we can see that some peaks they don't reach their full extent. Some here in the middle do, but some here don't. So when you look just for the f function to try to explain that, what we see is that, oops, uh, what we see is that when we add some kind of of Dresselhaus, like we treat Dresselhaus like a, a perturbation. Uh, here the red curve is just uh, Rashba. Uh, for Rashba, you see uh, you have basically just one frequency. That's that's the frequency of the beating I showed you before. You can, as a function of one over b, this is just this slope is just a frequency inside of cosine, so no problem. So when I start adding the uh, Dresselhaus, what I see is that those peaks don't reach the fr the full extent. So they make the the cosine not not reach one basically. So in the envelope function. So what we found out doing some calculations that I don't want to bother you with is that you can relate that to the beta over alpha parameter that you have. So in this way, you can uh, you can uh, probe the, the the beta parameter uh, over the alpha parameter, which you can easily find find by this kind of Fourier transform of that. This this frequency right here is just your basically your rush by. You can see when b equals to zero. This red curve here uh, represents Rashba. You don't have any central peak for the red curve, so you don't. You only have Rashba. And as you 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 increase Dresselhaus, it doesn't change much. So you can still you still have the same Rashba parameter. And from this other measure, you can get the beta over alpha. So you have alpha and beta in a reliable way uh, with this kind of simple method in this two deck with spin orbit coupling and Zeeman. Okay, so this is half of the work we've done using this f function formalism. Uh, is on uh, this paper. This is unpublished. We are writing it, currently finishing it. So now, if we try to apply this kind of formalism in topological materials, we we are using we are modeling this double quantum well with this uh, BHC model. Uh, Aggie spoke about that before. So 
uh, we, we can use some parameters from these guys. Uh, no problem. Here are the bands that I just spoke about, the S, uh, the S symmetry one, the P symmetry ones. So when you do that, you get the same thing, this kind of Hamiltonian. But here, uh, now you get, since you have bands and now you have like a 4D Hamiltonian, uh, what you get is another quantum number here that uh, accounts for bands. And here, in your f function, when you when you invert it, you still you, you you must have this kind of degree of freedom accounted here. So you have another new kind of pseudo spin uh, quantity. So this pseudo spin does something different here, which accounts which will generate a kind of signature of our beatings. So these are our beatings from that kind of system. And here, I am basically inside the. Uh, the, the Mexican hat. Uh, I'm, I mean, like low uh, energies. My EF is uh, around six eV. So here, w what we see is that we have like a beating with two frequencies, but those are too far apart. They are much more far apart than the ones that you get from common Rashba, for example. So this would account for like a signature in uh, spin orbit. Yeah, sorry, in topology. So we we could measure that a system is in on this topological phase uh, when we see those kind of different difference in frequency in beatings on those kind of systems. Oops, sorry. A T zero, so yeah, they they are at, at this point a T zero, but we know that for uh, higher T from other papers, uh, you won't you would only change that Dingo factor. So at higher temperatures, what you would see is a, it's a higher suppression of this curve. So uh, you, it would start uh, wiggling at about a higher magnetic field. So yeah. Uh, so here is as uh, in in our model back here. Whoops. Uh, I did. Oh shit. Uh, here, I didn't count for any spin orbit coupling. I'm just accounting for topology when I do these calculations. So, and here I compared it with spin orbit coupling, but separately. So now we are adding some kind of spin ad, uh, orbit coupling to see if this kind of um, of adding both together we will we will account for some kind uh, like if we can still realize that the system is topological with spin orbit coupling. We did this uh, only with linear Rajba at the beginning. Um, for for the same kind of uh, linear Rajba that causes the same splitting of, uh, for example, sorry, linear Dresselhaus that causes the same uh, splitting as linear Rajba, uh, what we get is what we expected. Uh, those big peaks we have from, from the signature of topology just split a little bit to account for the Spin, spi spi spin splitting. So we still see this kind of weird beating that shows a signature of topology in your system from our Shubnikov de Haas oscillations. So in conclusion, uh, well, in our, our simple kind of method, it can reproduce semi-classical results. I didn't show it, but we can fit like Rashba only uh, problems, and no, no problem. So we got a reliable method to get both alpha and beta parameters in experiments. Magnetic breakdown was described by that central peak in the Fourier transform I showed before. And in the topological material, we get a signature of topology with uh, that I we can differentiate from the spin orbit. That's why it's a signature, I guess. So yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you very much for listening. So, is there any question? So, so, so experiment.